Brendan um, has been on a journey for the last 13 years. And one of the things I've learned is that while a mission for an organization stays fixed, and ours is to change the way the world tackles poverty, the vision and the strategy for how you get there is indeed a journey. And if there's one real takeaway for you today that I think you could certainly see with that last group that was on stage, is that we started Acumen as an organization, small group of people. Here in New York, we wanted to change the way the world tackled poverty by investing, bringing patient capital to the fore, finding those companies around the world that, where we could prove a better way of, of solving poverty. And since then, we've grown from an organization to an organizational platform of trust and collaboration. And that really is about our next chapter. So what I want to talk about today is where we've come and how we're both focusing and expanding to really put that um, organizational platform into action. I just want to remind you all of what Acumen has done because of you. Because of you, there are more than 3 million people taken to hospital for the first time in most of their, in many, many generations across India, now serving a catchment area of 200 million people. Because of you in Rwanda, there is a company that is working with 10,000 farmers and seeing their incomes increase by 50%, exporting one of the world's fine premier coffees now from those farmers. Because of you, we invested pioneer capital in Delight when it was just an idea, a prototype. And for the last eight years, have been growing with that company. Because of you, 40 million people now have solar light. Because of you, we were able to invest in Pogatech, a mobile banking platform in Nigeria, when it had 50,000 customers. And last week, we got news that it just crossed the 2 million customer mark. And because of you, we took that crazy bet on three MIT graduates who had a better idea for how to solve the sanitation problem in Nairobi slums of three million people. With this notion that you could create a franchise of toilets and collect the waste, convert it to fertilizer, and somehow commercialize it for small, farm, small and large farms across Kenya. And while that company still has many hurdles to cross, Sanergy now has moved 20 metric tons of waste out of the, out of the, um, out of the slums. And we have 300 micro-entrepreneurs running their 500 toilets. And as you've seen, because of you, we've moved beyond companies. Because of you, we've got an ecosystem, a community now of near 300 fellows around the world who are doing just extraordinary things, running not only for-profit companies, but non-profits, expanding the way we think about how to solve poverty. Fellows like Ihitashri Sindania in India, working with artisans and helping to commercialize their products, bringing income not only to them, but to their entire villages. You also met the extraordinary Ken Olu, who is going to be one of the most important storytellers Kenya has because he speaks on behalf of those without voice. And Faith Mugai is working with another Acumen alum, Nick Pearson, to build a maternal health care center in Nairobi. And that's just a taste. Ken gave you some other um, examples of fellows, and you met some of the glo global fellows on stage recently. Sometimes we don't even understand the inspiration that our fellows give to us, and as Ken said, ripple through each other as we start to realize that we are in this together. I was in Pakistan about 10 days ago and um, opened up the newspaper and shared the horror that we all felt in reading about two Christian workers in a brick factory who had been accused of blasphemy and then tortured and incinerated alive in the kiln in which they worked. And in that same month, Acumen Pakistan fellow Shahid Ramat was pulling together workshops across faiths, Muslims and Christians, to take on the issue that for many people in Pakistan, Christians are relegated to, to the status of untouchability. And so when they work in their homes, they have a separate set of plates and cups for the domestic Christian workers. But at the end of these workshops, everyone comes together, and they bring the plates and cups that they had relegated, and they smash them on the floor, 
and then they all share tea. And in that cup of tea that they share across faiths is an act of protest and it is an act of hope. And these are the ripples that Acumen Fellows are starting to bring through each other, through our companies, through our partners, through all of us. It is about hope. So I want you to imagine what it means for us to move from investing out to this ecosystem. We start with our companies across the basic sectors of agriculture, healthcare, education, water, energy, and housing. And we surround them with 300 fellows now growing every year, 70 next year, 100 the year after. So you start to see thousands working not only across the sectors, but across lines of difference. They represent, as you've heard already, some of the wealthiest and the poorest from tribal areas and rural areas and urban slums, some who came from New York City and went to Harvard, a whole mix of individuals who have the chance to get to know each other because that is also part of our mission as a world if we're going to change it. And then you surround that community with the tools that we're building online. Acumen Academy, our online work, is now reaching, or will reach by the end of the year, 100,000. We want to grow that to a million. And we're starting to build tools then that are used by chapter members, 5,000 chapter members strong now across 27 cities. They're being used by others to then go and build companies, and sometimes just to change the way they do work within their own. And then wrap that whole community with the kind of tools and insights that Jer and Tom and Sasha are working on, bringing forth ideas that not only change the way we do business, but change the way the world does business. And you start to imagine the dream and the promise that is acumen. And I started to talk about the ecosystem at last year's investor, uh, partner gathering, and so I want to talk about it a little bit, starting, as we always do, with our portfolio. Because the investments that we make are the asset at the center. They are the crucible of everything that we do. We've learned a lot over the last 10 plus years of investing. And one of the real lessons, and Don and Ernest both touched on this, is that in the earliest stages, when you are trying to find a company that is busting through all of the stereotypes and the status quo, you need a different kind of capital. Pioneer capital, philanthropic back capital, so that you will even take the risk in the first place. When D-Light first started, it was literally a prototype type coming out of two guys from Stanford Business School. We could take a bet that nobody else could take. But as D-Light started growing, it needed a different kind of capital. Returns-oriented capital, large capital that's hard to raise with philanthropy alone where we can actually imagine going into the market to get low return capital that still is risky, but will enable a delight to get to the size that it got to. I had one of those clarifying moments that Acumen calls aha moments um, last spring when the head of a development finance institution did me and us a big favor because the institution was considering investing in Acumen's growth capital. And she said to me, when she called me to her office, that um, the investment committee felt that they were fully mission aligned with everything that Acumen does. And they love the work that we do. But they decided not to invest. Because at the end of the day, they said, she said, we're worried that if things get really difficult, Acumen will protect the poor rather than protecting your investors. And um, <sighs> I had to pause at that statement because if you think about what Barry's saying, that is not exactly a nuanced approach to understanding what it actually takes. Because it's true. We are here to solve po problems of poverty. We are here to stand with the poor. That is not mutually exclusive from a value system that recognizes we need accountability, we need excellence, we need rigor, and ultimately we need to build profitable companies that can serve the poor in ways they can access goods and services that they value and they afford. 
And that is what we stand for. And so I continue to make a plea for nuance. We must hold deeply embedded values in this world that we live in, particularly as it grows even more complex, even more unequal. And we must have the courage to stand for accountability. And that's really what we think about all the time at Acumen. And so how does that translate strategically? For us, it means that we have to be even clearer at articulating the early stage pioneer investing that Acumen is doing and be unabashed in backing it with philanthropy. So we need two kinds of capital. And I know there are some who say, well, Acumen's DNA is really in this early stage pioneer, so why do you bother with the growth capital at all? But if you take the story of Delight again, it took five years for, for Delight to move from zero to three million people served. When Don Tice came into the company in 2011, from then till now, you've seen it grow from three to 40 million people served. That's been the time where we've seen the learning, the insight, the impact, the voice. So we need both because it allows us to grow companies and allows us to do this early stage pioneering work that frankly, almost nobody else wants to do. And we've been doing a lot of it lately in difficult, messy sectors like education. And again, Barry surprised me by giving the, the, the language of rules and regulations. Because if you look at education in the countries in which we work, Pakistan is a country that is really dominated by incentives and rules because government has left a devastating vacuum when it comes to education for the poor. As a result, the private sector has stepped in. But the overwhelming number of private sector schools for the poor are focused on school as a business. There is no focus whatsoever on quality. And yet poor people are willing to pay because it's at least having somebody show up. India, on the other hand, is ruled by regulations. Government has so over-regulated the education industry that you can't even move or navigate to try to innovate. So in Pakistan, we're looking for those intrepid entrepreneurs who, like Ernest, it's, are focused on delivering quality at a price that is affordable, hard to do in health, hard to do in education. And in India, we're looking for those entrepreneurs that are moving around the constraints in the education sector, which means that most of our India investments are pre-K or vocational training. And we believe that in both, we will find models that long-term can partner with corporations and with government so that we can really start to build these at scale and show the world that if we focus on the end of bringing education to all our children, we have the tools to do it. But we've got to move beyond the constraints in which we live. And so we will make four investments by the end of the year, or have mostly already, both in India and in Pakistan. Housing is another issue where we've been pioneering. All across the world, slum dwellers have an impossible task when it comes to finding finance for building their housing because they work in the informal sector and they live on illegal land. I had the privilege of sitting in Dampati's home uh, in a resettlement area about two hours outside of Delhi, a resettlement area for those slum dwellers whose slums got demolished and get resettled to new areas. Dampati told me the story about watching her house of 15 years get bulldozed. And she and the nine family members with her ended up living in a tent for seven years before they um, found the means to build a, a two-room house, really only from moneylenders, who are the only people willing to support her. So Acumen is partnering and investing patient capital, pioneer capital, in the Self-Employed Women's Association, combined with um, the National Housing Finance Corporation and the regulatory authority to build a for-profit financing entity to lend to women like Dampati. And there are millions in India and billions across the world. Our pioneer capital allows us to continue to work in post-conflict areas. 
And as we look at the work we're doing in the early stage and the growth, we realize that to really build companies at scale that serve, serve the poor, we need to expand our entire toolbox. And you've heard this again throughout the day, that a really important way to do that is through partnership. And one of the things that's really struck me over the last year especially is that when you look at who's at the forefront of impact investing, ironically, it's often the corporations. And I think it's because the corporations understand what it takes to actually build companies in very low income markets dominated by people who are making one and two dollars a day. And so we've been forging some terrific partnerships with companies that are helping us to provide technical assistance and supporting our leaders program and possibly helping to build companies along their supply chain. And that is an area where we are just getting started. So Carlisle will talk about our portfolio of investments as the asset heavy part of Acumen. We have to own it. We have to put the resources in it. But the question is, how then do we leverage what we're learning? How, about, how, how then do we leverage what we're doing so that we don't only see direct impact on the lives that we're touching, but indirect app impact in terms of our overall mission? And we see it really in three ways, through learning, through inspiring the next generation, and through spreading ideas. But we're also really diving deep into the sectors. Don gives a presentation from one company's perspective about the potential for off-grid energy and the need for funds to make that happen. Well, Acumen has invested in nearly every subsector of alternative energy when it comes to serving the poor. We have a point of view. We know where impact is greatest. We know how the poor make decisions now. There is great knowledge and information, again, that will change the way we do business and also should change the way the world does business. And Barry talked about the need for us to highlight moral leaders out there in the world. And Don talked about an example of the best and the brightest among us that are working on a smaller and smaller set of problems that are reaching a smaller and smaller group of people. When the opportunity that we who have so much privilege really have is to take the best of ourselves and work on the biggest, toughest, messiest problems out there. But there aren't a lot of incentives. There aren't a lot of rewards to do that. And so how can Acumen do a better job not only of making those investments, but taking those entrepreneurs like Ernest and lifting them for the world to see that it is possible and this is the way to make enormous change. Sasha spoke about Isoko and Mark Davies and his ultimate goal being to increase millions of farmers' income by $150 a year, helping them move themselves out of poverty. What he didn't say is how hard it is for Mark to build this company, because 90% of his customers are illiterate, which makes a text messaging service kind of tough. When I went up to northern Ghana to see the farmers, I didn't see a single woman who owned a cell phone, despite all the numbers that we have on cell phones in Africa, another problem. So he looked at voice as his other option. But the issue in Ghana is there are eight languages, plus it costs eight times the cost to, to deliver a text if you send it by voice. And if you take that across Africa, we're looking at 700 languages. So that presents not only issues on your customer's ability to pay, but the talent that you hire, who have to be both agronomists and seriously multilingual, and the technology that you need, not to mention the trust you have to build. But when he does it, it could be a game changer for agriculture, for those farmers, and for the world. And that's the opportunity. And third, it's how does Acumen take the best of innovation that we're seeing in the world and share it with the rest? You've heard from several examples throughout the day companies that are now moving across Acumen's footprint. But we're also taking ideas from companies and moving them into other sectors even, where we start to understand what it makes to make change happen. And so as you can see, we start as an organization and we start moving into this collaborative platform. 
And on top of this, we start to create layers. When you saw this ecosystem panel and you heard about Mario and others talking about the work they are now doing, still as Acumen fe Fellows, connected to this community, accelerated by all of you, I am starting to see this everywhere I go. And in the same trip to Pakistan, I got to visit with Benji Williams, another global fellow. Now, Benji was placed in um, a water company in Lahore, Pakistan as, during his fellowship year. And then he went to Stanford Business School after that experience. After Stanford, he decided to go back to Lahore, although he's American, and build a vocational educational company based on the Acumen Fellowship model. And I sat with the 30 young people in his second batch of fellows. These are young people who are graduates of Pakistan's secondary and tertiary university, many of whom are the first in their entire family's histories who have ever gone to college. And for those of you who not only understand Pakistan, but many of the, the societies in which we work, if you don't have a name that is recognizable and you didn't go to a school that is recognizable, it's actually hard to make your way. But seeing Benji standing there, teaching the values of the manifesto, talking to these young people about what their opportunities were, connecting them to people within our community, suddenly you started to see that there is this accelerating force that is being built on a platform where we're, we aren't even doing enough to help support him take these ideas out to the rest of the world. And the day after, I got to visit Waqas Ali. Now you saw his Kickstarter campaign before I walked up. And in that Kickstarter campaign, you saw a village where men were making shoes. Waqas grew up an hour outside that village, which is two and a half hours outside of Lahore. He went to a government school and then dropped out of a government college, got involved in social media somehow, heard about Acumen, became an Acumen fellow, and decided that he was going to start this shoe company. And um, so he did. And it was rough going at the beginning. And then the Acumen community kicked in. Four Acumen fellows based in Pakistan, mostly global, coming with technology skills and finance skills, design skill. They helped redesign his shoes. They helped rebrand his product. They helped build a new um, website. They built a Kickstarter campaign. They put it online. Advisors like Seth Godin, Sasha on our team, helped with the messaging and getting it out to the world. And Wakas has now raised $107,000 on Kickstarter for his company, the most that any Pakistani has ever raised. He didn't do it alone, because none of us does it alone, not if we have big dreams. And it's the fact that we saw Wakas create this company and raise this money with other people from across the world in our community that makes me so excited by the, the online work that we're doing. This plus acumen work with just seven courses, mostly done in partnership, reaching 100,000 soon, starts to show us what can happen if we build out a suite of classes, courses, tools to reach a million people. And that's just the beginning. So when we think about the next chapter, it is about this ecosystem and the weaving of all the different threads that is acumen, that are acumen. When I think about the next chapter, it starts with our portfolio clarifying our investment theses, two pools of capital, building both out in ways that show the world what it means to create investment as a means, not an end. I see expanding our fellows program to every region in which we are operating, which means to move them, the fellows, into West Africa and Latin America so that we are growing by 100 every year. I see us taking this platform and not only having it be a platform for courses, although we are incredibly ambitious about those courses, but to, and to see those chapters and ways that we can work more effectively with those chapters, put the, the, the lessons into action. But on top of it, find better ways to connect you to each other 
across the globe. So that if you want to support Benji in Pakistan, there's an easy way for you to do it. Both funding, both mentoring. You heard Ken and others talk about that power of somebody really having your back. And so our platform has to be a global platform based on a community that is incredibly diverse but connected through shared values. But when you think of that vision, investing in companies, leaders, ideas, taking these ideas like big data, moving it out to the world, all of it matters only if at the very end we keep at the forefront of us always the people that we are here to serve. When I was last in Ghana, Sabrina, our new communications director, and I went to see um, an investment we had just approved in a toilet company. And um, I wanted to see the whole supply chain before I actually saw the toilets. And so we were taken to see one of about 480 public toilets that serve um, about 1.3 million people um, in Kumasi, outside of Kumasi, Ghana. And we started walking through the slum, and you could smell the, the toilet long before you saw the toilet. And as we got closer, the stench became overwhelming. And there were these guys sitting out front collecting money. And when we asked them if we could go in, they wouldn't let the guys go in, just, just the two women. And we weren't allowed to take pictures. And when we walked finally in, the, 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 the ugliness and the filth were extraordinary. But it was the stench that really overwhelmed, nauseated. I could feel disease and filth permeating my skin. I felt like color was coming up through the sandals of my shoes. And it was everything not to get sick. And I kept trying to imagine what it would be like to use that toilet once. Certainly not every day. And we went right from that public toilet to Abdul's house. And there we met this willowy, older man, 74 four years old, these beautiful hands and these thoughtful eyes. And um, he was so proud of his toilet. And I said to him, Abdul, tell me about dignity. And he said, I can't really talk about dignity, but I can talk to you about pride. He said, you know, that public toilet, we are customers but they treat us like beggars. Because every time we use it, we have to pay. But we stand in line for a really long time. And then when we go in, the filth is so bad. And I'm old, and I'm always worried that I might fall. And the stench is so deep that I feel sick, and I get stressed. And it makes it very difficult to ease myself, and sometimes I just can't. And when I can't, I walk home. And I have this feeling of disgust and shame. And he said, but now I keep my toilet really clean, and I use it whenever I need to go. He also keeps it behind a locked door, as I would myself. Um, and uh, when I looked at him and I listened to him, I couldn't help but think, this is not right. It is not right for a 74-year-old to have a toilet for the first time in his life. Yes, the government is providing public services, but they're providing it as a business whose customers they have made into beggars. We will not solve poverty with government nor charity alone. And we will not solve poverty with markets alone. We will solve poverty with justice, and we will solve poverty with a nuanced approach that recognizes that there are different tools to build solutions that enable every human being on the planet to have access to goods and services that let, that let them make their own decisions. That's what we want, and it is in our hands to do that. And that is what we have to do. 
and acumen by moving from just a constrained organization to an organizing platform moves acumen to an idea and a philosophy, and most importantly, a community. And that community is you. It's all of us. And what is most remarkable to me, as I watch the beauty of this community unfold, is that we are becoming a metaphor for the world. Because in our community exists the richest people on the planet, some who have ever lived, and the poorest people on the planet. We transcend race and class and ethnicity, gender and tribe. And that is why we are here, all of us. Because it is only when all of us can live with dignity that any of us can truly walk with it. And so I just want to say thank you to every single one of you for what you give, for bringing your best, for all that you are. Because at the end of the day, I don't only want to thank you for being part of Acumen. I want to thank you for being Acumen. So here's to the future. Thank you.